All right, guys, so in last class, I promised you a, a video in which I was going to get more quantitative with uh, simple harmonic motion. So let's just remember where we are here. We're talking about simple harmonic motion. And I'll redefine that for you in a second. So this is simple harmonic motion. And if we remember, this is a very specific type of a case of a vibration. So we've got something vibrating. Um, you'll hear me use the word oscillate. Oscillate means the same thing as vibrate. It just means something is going back and forth. And uh, simple harmonic motion has a, has a specific definition, and I'll remind you of that in a second. But uh, let's think of, I gave you two examples. I gave you the, the example of a pendulum, and then I also gave you ex an example of a mass on a spring. And it, I want to think about the mass on spring example. So let's imagine we've got this frictionless surface here, and we have a a spring and connected to this spring is some mass. So here's the mass M. And uh, we mentioned uh, that if you stretch this mass, right, if I were to take this mass from its equilibrium position and then move it out here, so here it's been moved, right, it's been, what we would say is it's been displaced. So we said it's displaced this distance here from here to here. That's delta X. And when it's displaced delta X, we mentioned there's going to be therefore a force backwards from the spring acting back to the equilibrium position so there's going to be a force here F um, and let's just you know so that we know what we're talking about here this right this is the equilibrium position um, now, you might remember the, uh, the definition, what made this uh, case of simple harmonic motion is that this force, F, is directly proportional to the displacement delta X. That's what makes this a simple harmonic oscillator, that the restoring force, F, is directly proportional to the displacement, uh, in this case, delta X. So I can write F is directly proportional to delta X. Um, and this is certainly a relationship. This is true. Uh, it sort of it, this is the definition of simple harmonic motion, but it's not a very strong relationship. I'd like to have maybe an equality here, try to figure out exactly what is the relationship between F, the force, and the displacement delta x. And we can do that pretty easily for this case using something called Hooke's law. So I want to talk about Hooke's law. This is going to be my first equation. I'm going to give you four different equations in this little module. And this equation, Hooke's law, um, uh, will uh, codify this relationship between F and del delta X. So here's Hooke's law. Hooke's law allows you to, f to calculate the force in a spring. So this will allow you to calculate a force in a spring. Okay. So the Hooke's law will calculate f spring force. And, and what it says is if you want to know the force in a spring, so I'm going to call that F spring, you only need to know two things. You need to know, first of all, the tightness of the spring. How strong is the spring? Is it a very thin, weak spring, or is it a thick, powerful spring? Um, and the strength of the spring is given by a spring constant K. Um, don't confuse this. I suppose we, we did talk about the electric constant. This is not the electric constant. This is uh, this right here is the spring constant. And it has uh, units of newtons per meter. That's the spring constant. And, and that's different for each spring. If you have a really weak spring, it might be something like this might be like uh, 100 newton meters. That would mean that to stretch the spring a whole meter, you'd only need 100 newtons of force. That wouldn't be a particularly strong spring. You could have springs that have huge spring constants, right? Tens of thousands of newton meters, right? If you think like a, a, one of those giant springs they use in the suspension of a large truck uh, would have a huge K value. So the strength, of the, the strength of the spring matters. The other thing that matters is how far you stretch it. I think that's obvious too, right? You stretch the spring farther, it pulls back more. And in fact, that has everything to do with this definition of simple harmonic motion. So F equals K times the displacement delta X. Um, and right here, we can see, uh, right here, 
we, we've taken away this is directly proportional to, we've taken away the squiggly and put an equal sign in. So this is a much stronger relationship. And we can see that, yeah, F is directly proportional to delta X. And uh, to turn into equality, all you need is this proportionality constant. In this case, the proportionality constant is the spring constant. One additional thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put a negative sign in here. And that's just to indicate that if I stretch it in one direction, the restoring force is opposite, right? If I pull the spring to the right, it is going to pull back to the left, which I think is pretty obvious. So here's Hooke's Law. We'll, be, uh, we'll have a chance to practice this next class in some detail. Um, but uh, I want you to, in addition to understanding this equation, I want, I, I want you to see that this is a, a stronger formulation of the definition of simple harmonic motion. This clearly is a simple harmonic oscillator because Hooke's Law is demonstrating this relationship, F directly proportional to delta X. All right. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, this is our, our first equation. Maybe I'll just put a little one right here for this little module. That's our first equation. Uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, throw a couple other equations at you. Um, so if you want to uh, think about a simple harmonic oscillator, if you want to think about simple harmonic motion, if you want to really get into the calculations, there's a few values that you might want to calculate that I had uh, mentioned before. So we talked just if we just recall this from before, uh, you might want to be able to calculate the period of the simple harmonic oscillator. And you also might want to be able to calculate the frequency of the simple harmonic oscillator. So these are two, uh, we had mentioned two different metrics, two different measurements um, that you might make for a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay. And, uh, what I want to do before I even think about how you're going to calculate uh, either of these is I want to uh, think about what the relationship is between them. So let's, let's remember what our definitions for period and frequency are. The period is the time in seconds for one full oscillation or one full cycle. So in the case of the mass on a spring, it would be the time in seconds to go from here past equilibrium and back to the starting position. So one full cycle. Um, Bear in mind, what is that in terms of x, right? You stretch it some distance x. Well, that would be x plus x plus x plus x. It would be 4x. Bear that in mind. That's what we mean by one full cycle. So it would be the time for that cycle. Frequency is, uh, it sounds very similar, but you'll, you'll understand that it's, that it's in some sense the opposite. If, if the period is the time for one cycle, the frequency is the number of cycles per unit time. So period is cycles per second, frequency is seconds per, or sorry, period, let me say that again, period is the number of seconds per cycle, frequency is the number of cycles per second. So what is that relationship? How can we sum that up mathematically? Well, it's just an inverse relationship. So the period, T, is equal to 1 over the frequency, okay? You can also, therefore, say you can just rearrange this equation and say that the frequency is equal to 1 over the period. So this is, my, this is the second equation for this little module that I, I want to throw at you. The relationship between the period and the frequency. Not, um, not too tricky a relationship, I don't think. So this is our second equation for this little lesson. Period, 1 over the frequency. Remember what our units are here. Um, period is measured in seconds. Let me put that out. So period is measured in seconds. And frequency is measured in hertz, hz. Well, remember what hertz is. Hertz, put this down here, 1 hertz, hertz equals 1 over seconds. So you can see this relationship. If, if, uh, if this is in seconds, this is 1 over 1 over seconds, so they're equal in terms of dimension. The frequency 1 over seconds equals 1 over seconds. The dimensions work out just fine. So two equations. We got so far Hooke's Law and now the relationship between the period of an oscillator and its frequency. All right, well, um, how would you know? Let, let's think about this. Uh, how would we calculate the period of an oscillator? Um, 
if I know the period, I can get the frequency. So if I can calculate the period, I know a lot about the oscillator. But how would I calculate it? Uh, well, it's going to be it's going to depend on the oscillator, and, and we have two. We've got the mass on a spring, which I'll deal with first here, and then we'll get back to the pendulum. So let's uh, let's go down here and uh, clear up some space. So calculating. period for simple harmonic motion, for simple harmonic motion. Uh, that's going to be our general topic here, calculating the period for, a, for simple harmonic motion. We'll start off, we'll do the mass on the spring first, so mass on spring, mass on spring. I'll just redraw this picture very quickly, frictionless surface, spring, Mass M. Uh, well, let's think about, um, let, let, let's think for a second, what is going to determine the period? So this thing is going to oscillate, right? It's going to go, let's say it goes, um, this is the equilibrium position. We'll define this as equilibrium. Um, and it's going to go some distance delta X. And so it's going to go, let's say, from here, that this will be the maximum displacement in the right-hand direction, and this will be the maximum displacement uh, left of equilibrium. So right of equilibrium, left of equilibrium, we can call these distances x. This is x, and that's x. Uh, so it's going to oscillate. It's going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we're curious about the amount of time it's going to take to do one full cycle. So starting here and going all the way here and back. How many seconds? Or you could start from here, all the way here and back. Or you could start from equilibrium, and then you'd go extreme this way, extreme in this direction, and back to equilibrium. So one full cycle. What is that going to depend upon? Um, so the period is going to be equal to something over here. Uh, one thing I want to point out that actually it turns out doesn't matter, and this is, this is not intuitive, oh is it does not matter how far you stretch this, this spring. In other words, if x is a centimeter, two centimeters, two meters, it doesn't matter how far you stretch it, the period is not going to change. Um, and that's very non-intuitive. Uh, most people would imagine that if you stretch it farther, since it has to move a much bigger distance as it oscillates, that it would take a longer period of time. That turns out not to be true. And the simple reason is, when you stretch it farther, there's a bigger force in the spring, which means a larger acceleration, which means larger average speed. So even though the, the mass is oscillating over a greater distance, it's doing so at a greater speed, and so the period ends up being the same. One th but there are a couple things that do matter. The first thing is the mass of this, this uh, system, right? W w how big is this mass that I've put on the end of the spring? Is it, does it weigh a gram or does it weigh a kilogram? That's going to matter. If it's heavier, if it's more massive, it has more inertia, which means that the spring is going to have a harder time accelerating that mass. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to move more slowly and therefore the period would be longer. So the relationship between the period and the mass is going to be direct. In other words, bigger mass means longer period. So I'm going to put an M here. Another thing that matters uh, is how tight the spring is, the, the, the tightness of the spring. It's, if it's a very strong spring, it's going to pull hard on this mass, and it's going to oscillate back and forth fast, uh, making the period smaller. Uh, so there's an inverse relationship between the strength of the spring, K, right? That's the spring constant, K. There's an inverse relationship between K and the period. Because if the k is very, very high, the period is going to be very, very low. So I'm going to put m over k. Now I'm going to add a couple little um, bells and whistles onto this relationship to make it work out. And I'm, I'm, I'm not actually going to derive them for you um, here. The first is that this is uh, a square root relationship. I'm not going to get into why it's a square root relationship right now, but just suffice it to say, if you want to calculate the exact value of t, you need to take the square root of m over k. It's still a direct relationship m and t, and an inverse relationship uh, k and t, but um, we have a square root in there. And the other little uh, bell slash whistle is uh, I'm going to put a little 2 pi out front. And I actually want you to think about why this is here. I'm not going to tell you right now, but um, we'll go over it in class. Well, why is this 2 pi here? I, uh, 
I had mentioned that there's a relationship between symbol harmonic motion and a sine wave, and I want you to think about what the 2 pi might have to do with that. Uh, and as I said, we'll go over it in class in some detail. Um, so this, here you go now, is the period for a mass spring system. Um, good, okay. So we have one more oscillator that we want to discuss, and that is the pendulum. Okay. So let's say I've got a pendulum. Here is my pendulum. And it's got some mass here, mass M, hanging from my pendulum. That's a pretty messy pendulum. I think we can do better than that. I'm going to give myself a little more room. There's my pendulum, and uh, I displace this pendulum. And remember, when you displace the pendulum, since the pendulum isn't moving in a line, right, the displacement here, as the mass moves back and forth, is a linear displacement, delta x. Here, the displacement is uh, angular displacement because the pendulum moves in a circle. So here, now I'm imagining I'm moving the pendulum up to this point here. So here's m now, and I've displaced it. And now my displacement in this case is delta theta delta theta here. So it's an angular displacement as I've moved it. And of course the restoring force is still there. Here's that F. We remember this from class. And again these are directly proportional, blah blah blah. Alright, well what would the period of this pendulum be? And uh, let's think about what one full cycle is. One full cycle means from this point through equilibrium, right? Remember this is now right here, this is what we're defining as equilibrium through equilibrium, delta theta through equilibrium, delta theta up again to this point, and all the way back. So be one full swing, one full back and forth, back and forth. So uh, how, long would, uh, how long would the period of the pendulum be? What would it depend upon? And this is, again, some of this is going to be non-intuitive. Most people think that it matters how far you pull this back. It, it, most people think it's... it's um, it would make sense to think that if I pull this back farther, it's going to take a longer time to oscillate. And it turns out that's not true. This is something Galileo proved long ago, that in fact the period of the oscillation of the pendulum is independent of how far you pull the pendulum back. Um, and that's, again, not intuitive. Uh, I should mention this. I should uh, just make a quick note. I mentioned this in class. But remember, uh, simple, a pendulum is only a simple harmonic oscillator for theta less than 15 degrees. So this relationship that I'm describing only holds for a delta theta here of less than 15 degrees. That's my little caveat. So uh, delta theta doesn't matter, provided it's less than 15 degrees. The delta theta doesn't matter. The, the amount of displacement is irrelevant. Um, the mass is also irrelevant in this case. And be, that has to do with the fact that the force that's accelerating the system is gravity. And in the absence of air resistance, we know all objects are going to accelerate the same. Um, so we're going to ignore also the mass. The mass is not relevant in this case. In this case, provided we're on Earth, which I think we can safely assume we are, provided we're on Earth, the only thing that matters is the length L, the length of this pendulum arm. That turns out to be the only thing that matters. Um, and so we end up with a relationship that looks like this. Square root again. L, the length of the pendulum, divided by G, the acceleration due to gravity. Um, remember, that's on, assuming we're on Earth, that's 9.8. And we do, again, have a 2 pi. We'll talk about why the 2 pi is there. Uh, but this is the length of the pendulum, L, divided by the acceleration due to gravity, G. And that is the period for a pendulum. Again, maybe potentially surprising that uh, uh, when we look at this equation that there's no M. That might surprise you. But remember, in the absence of air resistance, all objects fall at the same rate, right? You might remember way back when we said if I drop a rhinoceros and a piece of tissue paper, in the absence of air resistance, they fall at the same rate. Uh, also, again, no delta theta. Like there was no delta X up here, there's no delta theta down here. Potentially surprising. Um,
turns out um, the delta theta, as long as you're in simple harmonic motion, the amount of the displacement is irrelevant. Okay, so this was our, I mentioned four equations. I promised you four equations. Well, this was three, and this was four. So now we have four different equations. We've been fairly quantitative now about simple harmonic motion, talking about Hooke's law, the spring force, the relationship between the period and the frequency for an oscillator, and then finally specifically calculating the period for the mass on a spring and a pendulum. Remember, from these two, since we know the relationship between um, period and frequency, you would take the inverse of this to get the frequency. So remember, the frequency would be 1 over this whole thing, 1 over the period. Frequency is 1 over the period. So you just take 1 over 2 pi root m over k, 1 over 2 pi root l over g if you wanted to find the frequency. All right, I think that's enough for now. Um, uh, we'll practice these four, four equations uh, next time I see you in class.